Hello, and welcome to the second in a series of development and support webinars delivered by the NIHR Academy. My name is Holly Viles and I work in the Academy as Development and Support Manager. This webinar, Leading Through Uncertainty, Finding Growth and Meaning Through Times of Unprecedented Change, is delivered in collaboration between the NIHR Academy and Capfinity, one of our leadership development programme providers who currently deliver the Future Focus Leadership Programme. So with this webinar will be facilitated by Steph Hopper, Director of Development Solutions at Capfinity. For those attending the webinar live, as you leave the session, you'll be prompted to follow a link to a short feedback survey. This will give you the chance to share your thoughts on this webinar, as well as indicating future topics you'd find useful. The form will also give you the opportunity to provide your email address so that we can share slides and materials from the session with you. Steph, I'll now hand over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Holly, and um, uh, welcome, everyone. Leadership, the behavioural choices we make in order to create a different future. The words of Linda Ginzel, clinical professor of managerial psychology at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. We'd like to start today by reflecting on what we mean by leadership, a term in itself which needs clarification, as it isn't something which is fixed or constant in our world. And, and the word that I'd really like us to focus on is the in this definition is different. Based on our work recently, we've seen that leaders tend to make one of two choices in complex times. One is to continue and to manage the status quo. The other is to leverage adversity for change and growth. Today's session is focused on the latter idea, leveraging adversity for change and growth. We'll start by providing some context to the new normal, as we are calling it what leadership, uncertainty, leadership in uncertainty can look like, and secondly, to generate some practical support for you to help you enable your teams to feel valued, supported, and find meaning at this time. So our starting point is the context we're in. We've probably had about 20 years worth of transformation happen in the space of a month. This quote was taken from a photo essay in The Guardian by the journalist Johnny Weeks, who was documenting how the University Hospital in Coventry was dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. We thought this quote was a brilliant example of the challenge we face as leaders currently, which is you know, an absolute revolution in terms of the amount of change and uncertainty we're all juggling. It really chimed with me as a couple of my personal friends are um, partners at GP Practices. And as things kicked off, um, they talked about how in the matter of a weekend, the entire model of the way GP practices radically changed and was implemented and how breathtaking it was that this could happen at pace and at scale. But what we can't forget is change has been constant. And in regards to organisational change, the pace at which change has evolved can be crudely separated into these three areas. The linear and hierarchical industrial age had mostly given way to the network dynamism of the digital economy. Disruption already existed in everything from supply chains to business models to working practices. Mostly, these changes have been relatively slow and, and driven by technology. But right now, the pandemic we are living through has brought this into much sharper focus. The butterfly represents the fragility and the organic nature of our current situation. One that, for not wanting to overuse a word, but unprecedented, unfathomably transformational and just full of unknowns. Let's take a moment to reflect on our biggest personal challenge that is front of mind as leaders at the moment. Thank you. I, I, I'd just like you to keep that in mind as we go through this webinar and just reflect for a moment. How much control do you have over solving that challenge? And control is a really interesting concept in a time of crisis. Even on a personal level, people are trying to take back control. Things like the bulk buying we saw happen was a way of trying to take back control in what felt like a really uncertain and sort of shifting situation. And as leaders, when we're faced with this kind of ambiguity, there's a strong driver in us to micromanage and to hold tightly onto as many things as possible. 
The impact of that is that those around us can then start to feel less engaged and less motivated in the things they're doing. Yet that's often what we default to when we feel challenged as leaders. The pandemic is full of uncertainty. So naturally, leaders everywhere are struggling to find the right solutions as the context is changing almost hour by hour. In more stable times, we might naturally engage with our people back and forth like a pendulum along this spectrum, from directive to consultative. But in uncertain terms, we and in uncertain times, we naturally move towards a directive. This is what you need to do type approach. It's almost like we say to ourselves, the softer side of leadership is a nice to have for happy times. A researcher called Ellen Langer looked at the concept of control and found it is a cognitive bias, a systematic thinking error, which leads us to, to assume that we have complete control over the outcome of a situation in an instance where we don't. The biggest problem with control is it leads to frustration and sometimes even to anger. We blame ourselves for outcomes that aren't our fault. This is particularly true when the stakes are high. One simple form of this fallacy is found in casinos. When rolling dice, it has been shown that people tend to throw harder for high numbers and softer for low numbers. One of Langer's experiments, replicated by other researchers, involves a lottery. The participants were either given tickets at random or allowed to choose their own. They can then trade their tickets for others with a higher chance of paying out. Subjects who had chosen their own ticket were more reluctant to part with it and tickets bearing familiar symbols were less likely to be exchanged with others with unfamiliar symbols. So although the lotteries were completely random, the participants behaved as though their choice of ticket affected the outcome. Participants who chose their own numbers were less likely to trade their ticket, even for one in a game with better odds. So it's important to remember that although it's tempted to, tempting to lean in and to control, the impact on our followers who we must not forget are already heavily impacted by this crisis, professionally and personally, is that they will become more disengaged. So, does it matter how directive we are? Well, yeah, we think it does. Data collected during 2017 and 2018, and which was published last year, in the Gallup Negative Experience Index, found that already anxiety and stress were on the increase across the workforce. As you can see, it reported that more than one in three people surveyed reported experiencing a lot of worry or a lot of stress the previous day at work, which is the highest since they've been tracking this data in 2006. Three in 10 experienced a lot of physical pain and at least one in five experienced sadness or anger. Some really strong emotions there. So this global pandemic has hit us in the context of an already stressed and anxious workforce. So what could be the possible solution that we as leaders could consider? We think this is where compassion is needed and we instinctively understand what compassion looks like as healthcare providers. Compassion for patients is second nature and part of our DNA. But what does a compassionate leader look like? How do we demonstrate that we're showing compassion to our followers? Interestingly, according to Gallup, compassion is one of five key attributes followers are looking for from their leaders. So let's turn now to an expert to look at what compassionate leadership could look like for us. Michael West is a professor of work and organizational psychology at Lancaster. He describes compassionate leadership as in practice, it means leaders listening with fascination to those they lead, arriving at a shared rather than imposed understanding of the challenges they face, empathising with and caring for them and taking action to help or support them. I love that expression, listening with fascination. How often do I not do that when my mind is busy and full with all the distractions that I have every day? In his work with the King's Fund, who are an independent charitable organisation working to improve health and care in England, they've seen the best results are from leaders who truly engage with others by empathising with them and feeling the roller coaster of emotions they may be experiencing 
walking alongside their followers. What resonates with me is how different this is from the directive approach that we instinctively lean into during a crisis. But what does that look like? How can we be more compassionate and find meaning and growth for our teams at this challenging time? If compassionate leadership is about engaging, it's about empathising, it's about caring, it's about supporting others, how is it measured and judged by others? There's a whole host of models and theories related to this topic. What we've done is distill some of the best parts to explore with starting with, I guess, checking in on how we're doing. I heard a really interesting quote recently, which was something along the lines of, uh, questions never change, but the answers do. And John Maxwell, an expert in leadership development, has inspired these three questions. Do you value me? Can you help me? Can I trust you? These can act as a subconscious baseline for which all of our actions are filtered through by our team members. Something we often talk about in leadership development is starting with the end in mind. In that context, these three questions asked by followers to leaders are a simple way to think about whether we've succeeded at being compassionate leaders. The end goal would be to have our followers believe there is a positive answer to these three questions and that they feel valued, helped and trusted. With those questions in mind, I'd just love us for a moment to reflect on what did your followers need from you six months ago? And then what is it they need right now? The chances are that what they needed right now is different from what they needed a few months ago. That's not just because of the pandemic situation, but because of the ever changing, shifting curves we're constantly experiencing. So in order to lead through uncertainty, we need to understand what that journey looks like and how our needs change along the way. Some of us may already be very familiar with the change curve, maybe something you've used in, in your practice, whilst for others, perhaps this is a new concept. The change curve is based on a model originally developed in the 1960s by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, to explain the grieving process, Kubler-Ross proposed that a terminally ill patient would progress through five stages of grief when informed of their illness. Since then, it's been widely utilised as a method of helping people understand their reactions to significant change or upheaval. I think the real beauty of the change curve is it's always worth coming back to. It's a great reminder of where our awareness is at times like this and to use it as a sounding board for individual and group journeys through adversity. In fact, Kubler-Ross proposed that this model could be applied to any dramatic life-changing situation. And since then, the change curve has become a firm fixture in change management circles. Although I should say there are lots of variations of it in terms of the stages and the names on the curve, but the source of all of them is Kubler-Ross and Kessler's five stages of loss research. Essentially, aside from a, a small uplift um, at denial, the first half is a, is a downward to crisis, the lowest point of the cycle. And then there's a journey from normal to a new world. From here, typically, there is exploration and experimentation before finally, in its best case scenarios, we move into a new normal. But there are a number of fallacies about the curve, and I'd love to see what we as a group already know about the curve. So I'm gonna share with you a poll now, and it's a true or false uh, vote that I'm looking for you to um, make. Uh, your your um, answers are completely anonymous, so please don't feel concerned, but it'd be great to get a sense from you in the room, uh, whether you think these statements are true or false. So I'm opening the poll for you now, it should pop up on your screen, and I'm gonna give you one minute to complete it. So the first statement is, a change curve lasts an average of 60 days. Do you think that's true or false? The second is, you can be on more than one curve at a time. Do you think that's true or false? The third is, understanding why helps to speed up the journey. True or false, what do you think? The fourth is, the route through the curve is linear and has one outcome. 
true or false? You've got 20 seconds left if you haven't yet voted. Knowing where we are on the curve is helpful, both to us and to others. Do you think that's true or false? 10 seconds left, folks, 10 seconds left. I can see the numbers ramping up as you get your final votes in. That's great. Brilliant. And your minute is up. So I'm going to end the poll there. And I'm going to share the results with you. So these will appear on your screen while we have a look at what the general sense is in the room. So um, our first uh, statement, a change curve lasts an average of 60 days. So really interesting. 25% uh, of you think that could be true. 75% of you think that's false. Um, you're spot on the people who thought that was false. The change curve isn't time bound. Um, and it's always or, or and it's not always sequential. There are often multiple things changing in our lives. So we might be on multiple stages simultaneously. And some people may go through this in a matter of hours, others in months, even years. You can be on more than one curve any one time. 92% of you thought that was true. Spot on. I'm preaching to the converted there. We all understand that and you know we could be going through a, a, a house move mind you probably not many of us are moving house at the moment but we could be going through you know a change of where we live on top of a change at work on top of maybe um, a change in um, something that we do um, outside of work so multiple curves can be occurring at any one time understanding why helps speed up the journey so 83 percent of you thought that was true 17% of you thought that was false. I have to say the 17% were correct. And this one is fascinating. So people need to understand changes before committing. There's no doubt about that. Another building block of traditional change management thinking is that people must have an intellectual understanding of a change before they can embrace it. But there's been some really interesting research by Accenture that indicates that this so-called commitment curve held true for lower performing groups. But amongst high performers, trust in management was at such a level that people are willing to commit before they even know what the change project is or what the goals of the change are. Organisations that have trusted leaders can be begin implementing major change without first needing to educate the entire workforce on the minutiae of every change initiative. So hold that thought because we will come back to trust a little bit later. Number four, the route through the curve is linear and has one outcome. 97% uh, of us thought that was false, you are spot on. Yet we can go backwards, we can get stuck, um, which makes it appear that it has different outcomes at times. And knowing where we are on the curve is helpful, both to us and to others. 99% of us thought that was true, and um, I would agree with you. Um, it's true, but the journey, one thing to keep in mind is it's not the same for everyone. Lucy English, a VP of research at a company specialising in workforce resilience, um, she found that 50% um, of people are worst case thinkers. So in a crisis, they'll be operating from fear, contributing negative energy and sharing doomsday scenarios. So I guess the thing to keep in mind is, even in a crisis, people don't have the same needs. What's different in a time of unprecedented change, i.e. at the moment, is the stages on our change journey feel more apparent, more distinct, where it's you know, explicitly aware of change happening. Six months ago, we may have been journeying through a kind of a mild curve, maybe more than one mild curve, barely registering the stages, whereas today it's in sharp focus. Teams, families, individuals will be going through a roller coaster of emotions. The positioning of a colleague a family member or ourselves on this change curve can therefore impact really our ability and, and, and their ability to focus and flourish at work. So how can we uncover those needs as leaders to help others to flourish? Let's look at that now. Um, you do need to close your poll results, so you just have to close the window yourself and it will disappear. What we do know is that people have different needs at different stages on the curve and as a leader we can impact the journey on the curve by trying to anticipate those needs and that's what I wanted to talk about now. A pretty familiar scenario at the moment could be for anyone suddenly thrust into working from home 
who doesn't usually do that. And I know that some of you um, will still be going to a place of work. But I also know, having coached a number of NIHR leaders, there are quite a few of you who have had that happen and are suddenly thrust into the, the kind of strange environment of working from home. And I guess those of you going into workplace may find that you've got partners at home who are suddenly at home every day. So I think the first sort of stage of this around shock and denial was this is awful, but I'm sure it will just be a couple of weeks and we'll kind of be back to work as normal. That kind of mixture of shock and also, you know, denial that it's going to go on for any period of time. I think most of us thought we'd lock our doors and we'd be out in a few weeks. The person at denial needs confirmation. They need clear direction and leadership, stability. They also need some concrete evidence and facts. And at this stage, we need to be assertive, but give them breathing space to come to terms with things in their own time. Empathy, reassurance, honest communication are going to be useful here. And we shouldn't ignore the person or kind of allow them to opt out. Sometimes around organisational change, what you see is at this stage, you might be having a briefing meeting and you've got your team members who kind of don't turn up because they're too busy. Often that can be a sign of that denial. So just keep an eye out for that. Second stage is confusion and disbelief. How am I supposed to work on that project we were all, you know, sat in an office talking about a few weeks ago? Or engage with a team that aren't physically around me? I've never done this working from home thing and, and now I've got to homeschool children as well. The person at confusion really needs people to understand how they feel and be given the space to express it. They need to be able to share with you the impact the changes are having on them or they think that those, those, you know, the, they think or anticipate what, those, uh, what the impact will be. And as a leader, we need to respect that person's feelings and show empathy for their situation. Give them some space to vent. They may be looking for a way to bargain. And although that may feel challenging, it's the beginning of them accepting the, the, the changes. So that bargaining is like their way they start to engage. Third step is crisis. And um, it's when we suddenly say, I can't do this. This is completely overwhelming. This is too hard. Everyone's arguing at home. I'm just getting through the motions of what kind of comes in front of me each day. I'm not able to be proactive. I don't feel present for my family or for my home. At that stage, we need to show empathy. But also through communication and training, help the person handle all their real or perceived problems in a practical sense. Focusing on short-term realistic goals that are recognised when achieved can help the person to move on. And that's normally my favourite moment is when you can come up with some really small short-term goals that psychologically help someone take a step forward, make such a big difference. In a completely different context, I can remember that being said to me by a career coach when I was really unhappy in a job I was in. She said, if you just take a couple of steps to help yourself, you'll feel better. And, you know, spending an evening just, I don't know, updating my CV or my LinkedIn profile, suddenly I felt like I'd taken back some control for myself and was doing something to move myself on from crisis. Then we get to experiment, experimenting. And I guess in that working from home scenario, it could be people hit a stage where they've created a new routine. You know, they've got maybe some flexibility in their hours. They've moved their working hours around a bit. They're perhaps using a bit of technology to help them. Um, they have found that probably doing a bit of homeschooling at eight in the morning and at 12 o'clock means that when their children are watching five hours of television a day, they can feel a little bit more relaxed. The person experimenting wants reassurance above all else. The manager there should really be coaching and training people, you know, providing lots of praise, sharing good news stories and successes, not dismissing ideas or focusing on mistakes or things that haven't worked, really trying to focus on the things that have gone well. But there's a couple of scenarios I wanted to share with you, which we need to watch out for around the change curve, even if we are very familiar with it already. Scenario A, having those around you at different stages of the curve at the same time, very common for us as leaders. Scenario B, you as a leader being ahead on the curve because you have more information than others. It's worth thinking about 
which of those you personally find more challenging? And I know having asked leaders, often it's the first one. Personally, I find the second one really hard. When I connect with my team members, it's really important to me to be authentic and to be real. So when I'm given information, especially information that perhaps is, you know, sinister in nature or difficult, I find for me, it can feel like almost a, a block between myself and my team members. But my responsibility and my role requires me to hold that information. And then I have to remember that when that information is shared more broadly, they are just starting out on that change curve again. I've actually probably been on it for a week or two, probably got used to it. So when they are shocked by the news, got to give them that space. Both of these scenarios are hard and it, and it probably doesn't really matter which one you find more challenging. What matters is having awareness of them, awareness of your own journey and of others' journeys. We thought about the stages of the change curve and some of the ways we can support our followers. Let's now think about how we can help our followers to leverage change in support of growth and new meaning. The biggest success we could have as leaders is to be able to leverage the change to support growth and for it to become positive. After the lowest point of the change curve, there is an uplift. The extent of this lift is shaped by many things a large part by the behaviour of the leaders around us. The objective is to lift those around us, I guess, from crisis to acceptance, and then ultimately to growth and personal learning. Failure to achieve this can delay positive progress and can result in a possible relapse or an extended crisis, which we want to avoid. Integration is when we adopt some of the changes. Maybe we cherry pick the things that we like, but don't adopt the core change. And actually going back to the example we've talked about, suddenly being asked to work from home unexpectedly. Integration probably looks like carrying on as best we can. Perhaps not, perhaps not embracing new technology or new opportunities, but working to a degree and sort of carrying on as you did previously, just in your home environment. And actually, if you think back to the statement we started with, um, from Linda Gazelle and we talked about the two choices that leaders have you know managing the status quo or helping our followers find growth and meaning this is the managing the status quo is integration keeping things going on a level what growth and meaning look like in terms of you know how we leverage those in adversity perhaps people finding hope and gratitude in things like we've gained so Perhaps around that working from home scenario, you know, we've suddenly got some family time. Maybe we're having dinner with people in our household that we never normally did because we were commuting. Perhaps we've got some time to reflect and plan our workload because in the morning we're not commuting and we can go and do some exercise, which gives us some thinking time. Perhaps a renewed focus on the things that are really dear to us and important to us as we notice a light is almost shone on the things that we can't do anymore reassessing our old mindset and kind of finding new perspectives. There's a really interesting anecdote which comes from the world of business, but I think it's a lovely illustration of growth and new meaning. It comes from Paul Pullman. He is the CEO of Unilever and he took over at the height of the financial crisis in 2009. He decided to kind of take a bit of a risk and focus the company's purpose around launching a sustainable living plan that had, to, uh, you know, had a goal of improving the health and well-being of over one billion people. He invited employees to find really creative ways to help them meet their goals, which included improving livelihoods, halving the company's ecological impact, improving gender parity. And actually what's fascinating is they achieved most of those targets, including gender parity in their management and the use of 100% renewable electricity worldwide. And what went along with that was a total shareholder return of 290%. It's a great example of a leader helping people to find meaning and growth and actually delivers amazing results from a difficult situation. And so we return to our three questions posed by John Maxwell at the start of the session today, as these can act as a good benchmark for us, because if the answers are positive, we may well be doing a good job of helping them to move through the uncertainty and create a culture of growth and meaning so that our people feel valued, 
helped and full of trust in us as leaders. So let's look at how we can do that. Demonstrating that we care, showing that we value um, our followers. Let's take a moment and reflect on how we rate ourselves on demonstrating to our followers that they feel valued. I'm assuming most of us would think we do a reasonable job, but perhaps not a 10 out of 10. But what would a 10 out of 10 look like? I was coaching an NIHR leader recently, and I have to say I felt he encapsulated this brilliantly in how to do this well. He had a core strength of humility, and it was obvious he was really energised by ensuring people got the credit for what they did well, and that he showed them appreciation for their contribution. He had a strong focus around helping to develop his research team and clinical staff and, and progress their careers, and was willing to give them time, his ultimate resource, and space. He was passionate about helping to find opportunities to develop their strengths, and would advocate for them, especially when they weren't in the room, and also feedback to them. And he saw his role really as partial, the success almost of his um, role was whether he could move them on and give them opportunities that would eventually make him feel that perhaps he was part of his sort of protege success in some way. Overall, the key objective to feeling valued is to create a culture of belonging. Belonging is fundamental to human well-being and the need to belong is greater during a crisis. Everyone can feel frightened and overwhelmed in, a, in the situation we now face. No one is unique in that. We cope by feeling valued, supported, loved, cared for and building a sense of belonging as part of a larger caring whole. And our immediate work group, team, department is critical. Not only must leaders ensure a positive, caring, supportive climate, but also encourage and enable sustained multidisciplinary team working when everyone, where everyone is clear about each other's roles and how we can make the most of each other's strengths. Let's now look at the next question. Can you help me? And think about what can sometimes get in our way. So giving time and practical support can make a huge difference to productivity, innovation and well-being, as you can see from the data on the screen. What can be hard for us is, it's mass is time is a massively limited resource. And what we have to remember, though, is that just a few minutes of regular time engaging with our followers will go a long way. Checking in, finding the balance of when to coach versus being directive. And in the current context, help is more aligned to understanding different needs and uncovering them when your team aren't in front of you and really appreciating the different strengths and therefore the different needs of your followers. And you can provide the best practical support to them. But it's not just practical support that they need in terms of help, it's also emotional support. We might think we already know how to ask questions, but to really uncover what could be going on, we need to ask the most appropriate questions, accompanied by a willingness to listen to the answers with humility. Asking helpful questions creates a genuine space to think, grounded in spirit of alongsidedness, and demonstrates we're a compassionate leader. A simple tweak to a question from how are you to how are you today can have a massive impact. I remember very clearly reading a Facebook post by Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, about five years ago, around a month after her husband suddenly and unexpectedly died. It really stuck with me as one of her suggestions was that instead of us asking people, how are you, when we know they're going through a tough time, we might say, how are you today? Here's what she said. Even a simple, how are you? Almost always asked with the best of intentions is better replaced with how are you today? When I'm asked, how are you? I stop myself from shouting back, my husband died a month ago. How do you think I am? When I hear, how are you today, I realise the person knows the best I can do right now is to get through each day. And it's something I've practised in many situations since. Even with my own father in his final year of life, he found it really frustrating that with people say, how are you, John? And he would kind of be almost irritated by the question. He felt people didn't really want him to answer that question truthfully. And from that moment on, I made a commitment to change that in my dialogue. So whenever I've got team members going through difficult times or friends or family members, 
I try to stop myself instinctively saying, how are you? And just saying, how are you today? Helps me to connect with them emotionally during that difficult time. Let's move on from um, how we provide help. I'm just wondering, what do you think are the three hardest words to say in the English language? I wonder if you know the answer to that. And, and maybe many of you have gone to medical terminology, which certainly for me would be unpronounceable. But actually the answer is something a little closer to home and really relates to our third question. Can I trust you? The answer is, I don't know. They are the three words hardest to say in the English language. And it's fascinating how difficult we can find it to say. Most of us have built our careers on our successes, our knowledge, our promotions, our reputation. We've been sharing expertise throughout our careers and controlling our personal brand by always appearing to have an answer. And in many situations where we're regarded as the, as the expert, it wouldn't feel appropriate to say, I don't know. But the impact of this can be the difference between our followers buying into our authenticity as leaders and showing that we're teachable. We don't always have all the answers. And this can be the difference between our followers feeling that they trust us or not. Amanda Waterman teaches development psychology at the University of Leeds. A lot of her research is about people's willingness, especially children's willingness to say, I don't know. Some of her early research looked at whether kids would say, I don't know, when asked a patently ridiculous question. Results have varied in her studies, but you're looking at maybe two thirds to three quarters of children between the ages of eight and five, five and eight, um, who would say yes or no to a yes, no question that they actually don't know the answer to. They also found about a quarter of adults tried to answer the yes, no, unanswerable questions too. So it just shows that actually there is an instinct in us to want to always give the right answer. Is this important? I guess trust is saying, I don't know, and being authentic and not having the answers is part of that. Another of Gallup's surveys showed that only one in three employees trust their leaders within their organization. So not everybody in this webinar may be at the top of their organization. But I wonder, do we think that idea is instinctively right or wrong? Do you think a third of your team members are the only people to trust you? Most of us would find these numbers quite concerning. It's important to think about our departments, though, and our multidisciplinary teams and whether we as leaders are showing up and demonstrating the best version of our authentic selves to help people trust us. Remember that Accenture research and how critical trust can be in helping people move along through change. So we've thought about what we can do to ensure we lead compassionately, but our foundation has to be looking out for ourselves. Higher levels of self-compassion have repeatedly been associated with psychological well-being, as well as increasing emotional and physical resilience. You may have already heard the airplane oxygen mask analogy, but there's a reason why they say it in the safety checks on an airplane. You've got to take care of your own mask before you can take care of anyone else's. The same applies to treating ourselves with self-compassion. We cannot help others if we're not helping other, ourselves too. Focus on the image. It's from the New Yorker. Sometimes I feel like the narrative is about what you're achieving in the pandemic, how you can use this time to be productive, get the most out of life, develop more skills. The impact of that is not the same for all of us or all our followers. We're not all in the same boat. Some people are in the front line, they're in the eye of the storm. Some of us have team members who've been furloughed, their research projects on hold. Others are still working, though at home. And perhaps you've got family members sat on the sofa watching Netflix. Ultimately though, our internal narrative is constantly about what are we doing? How are we using this time usefully? And giving ourselves a hard time in how we measure up to everyone else. This is where we need to practice self-compassion. Be kind to ourselves at all times. It's a foundation if we're going to be compassionate leaders. We won't be able to support others right if we don't get this right. So in summary, be aware of the unpredictable change journeys everyone goes on. Don't assume you're all on the same path. And remember, you are a leader who is often ahead of your followers around the change you're experiencing in the workplace. And notice your location on the curve in relation to others. 
uncover new and authentic ways to make people feel valued. Remember, just a small amount of time and appreciation can go a long way. Build trust through honesty and authenticity. How can you be the very best version of yourself for your followers? Show compassion, start with yourselves. Wanted to end the session with a quote from the author, Arundhati Roy, that depicts the global pandemic as a portal, a door to a new beginning. She says, our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. The question is, what do we want to take with us and what do we want to leave behind? What learnings will we have about our lives, personal and professional, which will serve those new beginnings? Conversely, what learnings do we have which we want to leave behind to keep in the past? Thank you for your time today.